Tax Analyst is proud to announce a partnership with the American Bar Association Section of Taxation to launch the Tax Analyst Public Service Fellowship. This new two-year fellowship offers practicing tax attorneys the opportunity to work in public interest tax law with a nonprofit or government entity. For the inaugural year of this fellowship, the sponsoring organization will be La Posada Tax Clinic in Twin Falls, Idaho. The tax section has opened the application period for the inaugural fellow. Applications are due July 29th. Applicants should have three to five years of experience practicing tax law and be willing to relocate to Twin Falls, Idaho. For more information and for links to apply, see our press release at taxnotes.com slash fellowship. That's taxnotes.com slash fellowship. Welcome to Tax Notes Talk, a podcast from Tax Notes, the leading source of tax news, information, and analysis. Welcome to the podcast. I'm David Stewart, Editor-in-Chief of Tax Notes Today International. This week, good as gold. The idea of immigration often conjures up black and white images of huddled masses on ships in New York Harbor, people seeking new opportunities to make their fortune. But what happens for people who've already made their fortune and don't have time to wait in line for the normal process? And what about the growing class of remote workers who don't need to be physically anywhere? This week, we're talking about golden passports with Tax Notes reporter Elodie Lemaire and Tax Notes contributing editor Nana Amasarfo. Elodie, Ama, welcome to the podcast. Hi. Thank you for having me. Thanks, Dave. It's really great to be here. Well, why don't we start off with what are we talking about when we use the term golden passport or golden visa? Elodie, why don't you start us off? Yes. Um, So I think there is a distinction to be made between golden passport and golden visa. So golden passports grant you citizenship in exchange for an investment. It can be different kind of investment. Uh, For example, in Cyprus, you have to invest in the uh, investment fund or buy a house or by sharing a company. Residency, so golden visa is about residency. So it grants you residency rights if you do the same kind of investment. So there's a a big difference in the EU because once you get citizenship in an EU country, you get EU citizenship, which means that you get many rights. The right to settle anywhere in the EU, the the right to work, the right to move freely, and uh, the right to vote or even run in local and uh, EU elections. So it's a big issue for for the EU. Residency is a bit different because you get residency in an EU country and then you can move freely, but you don't have the same rights, not settling or uh, working anywhere else. When we talk about golden visas, often the threshold for getting temporary or permanent residency is usually much lower than with a golden passport. If I may add, So as the European Commission sees it, it's really a shortcut to citizenship or residency, and you can get it without having any genuine link with the country. And that's an issue for the Commission. All right. So, Ama, why do countries offer these? Well, Dave, countries want investment. They want wealthy investors pouring money into their infrastructure and into their economies. And these golden visa and golden passport programs essentially are a way to guarantee that because investment is mandatory for receiving the residency or uh, citizenship benefits that these investors seek. So in the case of Cyprus, for example, they started it just after they went through uh, the crisis and the Eurozone bailout. So according to Al Jazeera, who made an investigation in this in 2020, between 2013 and 2020, they had 8 billion uh, euros in revenues. Now, are there any countries other than Cyprus that are, that are known for these golden visa programs? So on golden visa, so residency, there are actually a lot of countries, but it doesn't mean that conditions are not strict. For example, Luxembourg, Latvia, they offer this kind of of residency uh, by investment program, but the conditions are much stricter. On golden passports, so citizenship, you still have Malta. Cyprus and Bulgaria, they, they recently told the commission that they would abolish it. So you basically have Malta which is still in a legal battle with the commission because the commission says we want it removed in the next two months. So that's it. That's for the EU. Well, I would add that countries all over the world have both of these programs, I think in just about every continent except Antarctica. But I think that when people think about golden visas and golden passports, they often think about countries with very large tourism markets. So Caribbean countries, Thailand, Greece, et cetera. All right. And I'll have to admit, I'm going to probably just switch back and forth between the term passport and visa, but we're, we're generally talking about them separately. 
So what sort of individuals are taking advantage of these golden visa or golden passport programs? Well, we see that there are wealthy individuals in countries who want investment certainty and might not be able to get that domestically. So due to economic or political instability. So oftentimes those sorts of high net worth individuals will seek a golden passport or golden visa program. During the height of the pandemic, during the height of lockdown, we saw wealthy individuals in countries where it might be difficult to obtain a foreign visa to travel, seeking these sorts of programs because they wanted to ensure that they could have continued access to the world for personal or business reasons. They want a passport that facilitates easier travel. We also see other wealthy individuals who want to lower their tax burdens. They want to perhaps find a jurisdiction where they don't have to pay wealth or inheritance taxes. And that becomes a motivating factor for seeking a program. And then, of course, on the other hand, you also have individuals with ill intentions. So people who are tied to organized crime or other illicit activities who perhaps want to launder their money and see these investment programs as a way to do so. Coming back to the uh, Al Jazeera uh, Cyprus paper in 2020, um, their investigation showed that there were people being accused of corruption in a telecom deal. The former boss of Gazprom, who was wanted for embezzlement, people who were who wanted in Ukraine but were not there to answer the charges because they were somewhere else thanks to the visa or the the passport. So any kind of criminals or even politically exposed person, it also showed that a relative of Ben Laden was was amongst the beneficiaries. So all kinds of people. And what this investigation showed also is that the due diligence of Cyprus, which actually the condition said, you have to have a clean criminal record, but that was never really respected. Well, in many cases, it wasn't respected. Support for this podcast is provided by SafeSend. Empower staff with tax automation software that is transforming the accounting profession. The SafeSend suite improves your firm's processes, from engagement letters and client organizers to assembly, delivery, and e-signing of tax packages, the SafeSend suite makes it easy. Clients love the intuitive, consistent experience at every step of the tax engagement. Staff love reducing the time they spend on manual labor-intensive tasks. Schedule a demo at safesend.com to see it in action. That's safesend.com. So I I take it that there are corruption issues. Are there other downsides to a golden visa or golden passport program? Well, from the uh, EU perspective, the thing that the commission, even the parliament, call it a Trojan horse because, uh, I mean, it's one thing to grant residency or citizenship and have the bad consequences for you, but... When you do it at EU level, well, in an EU member state, it means that it has consequences for all the EU member states because when you give citizenship, you give rights in every member state. So it has consequences for all the EU. I would also add that sometimes the optics can be negative for governments in giving everyday citizens the impression that their governments are focusing their energies on essentially courting the 1% and giving them these plum economic opportunities instead of trying to essentially spread the wealth and offer economic opportunities to people across all sorts of economic backgrounds. So what are the tax implications for individuals taking on these golden passports and golden visas? According to a 2018 uh, study by the European Parliamentary Research Service, um, apart from giving those individuals access to a specific tax regime, One of the issue is the possible circumvention of the common reporting standards. So basically, if you have a foreign bank account, but if you have residency in the country of the bank, you can just tell the bank that you live there. So the bank doesn't know it has to give the information to the tax administration of the country where you really live. So it's a possible circumvention of this common reporting standard and the exchange of information. And the commission has um, noticed it recently. And the commission recently said that it would make sure, it would try to make sure that the uh, directive on an administrative cooperation for tax matters was uh, well implemented and that it was considering infringement procedure if it's not well implemented, specifically to tackle this possible circumvention of uh, the CRS thanks to golden uh, residency. We're talking to golden visa. 
Now, I understand that the EU is putting some of these programs under scrutiny. What is the EU saying its concern is here? So in the EU, there is some sort of systematic fight against uh, mostly golden passport, because as I said earlier, it has consequences for the whole EU because it gives the right to work settle anywhere in the EU. So the commission says that it is uh, granting citizenship in exchange for an investment without any genuine link to the country is actually not compatible with the principle of sincere cooperation that is enshrined in EU treaties, but it also undermines the integrity of the status of EU citizenship. Um, so the commission wants it to stop. So it is in a legal battle with Malta right now. And in April, the commission told Malta, you have two months to just get rid of this, uh, of this scheme. The Maltese press says that um, the government is considering phasing out the, the scheme or just reforming it. So we don't know yet what they will do. So the commission will probably uh, bring the matter to court if uh, Malta doesn't act in time. Uh, it would be the first time that this would be tested in court. I mean, the commission has looked for a way to attack those uh, those schemes for a very long time. They, they, they found legal grounds, the one I, I just described before, but it has never been tested in court. So we don't know what the, the court of justice might say on this. Uh, so obviously, I guess they would rather avoid this. So let's see what uh, Malta is going to do. And on residency, there is many domains in which the EU is trying to act because the, the EU doesn't have a competence to tell member states what they should ask for um, before granting residency. So basically, there's a proposal now from the Commission from a few weeks ago that says that you really have to monitor that someone is actually living in the country before granting residency. And um, there's also another piece of legislation that is being negotiated in each institution. So each institution has to form a negotiating position. And in the parliament, in the anti-money laundering, the new anti-money laundering regulation, they also introduce stricter provision on residency. But I don't know if it will fly with member states. So let's see. And the last thing the commission has done was said it's that countries which granted citizenship or residency to um, Russian or Belarusian close to uh, Putin or the Kremlin should just uh, revoke it. And Malta has announced that it has done it. So since the pandemic has changed just about everything, how has that affected the golden passport, golden visa area? Well, there's been a really significant increase in the number of people looking for golden passports, and I think particularly golden visas. As Elodie had mentioned, these sorts of programs are especially important in times of economic stress. She had mentioned Cyprus. So whenever there's any sort of financial crisis, governments look to how they can offer these sorts of packages for outside investors. And so what we saw during the pandemic was that there was a very strong allure for people living in countries that had weak passports, as I had mentioned before. And so there's one particular firm, it's a London-based Henley and Partners. They help clients uh, navigate these programs and they found a 25% increase in inquiries from high net worth individuals asking about golden visa programs. And they found that a lot of these inquiries were coming from emerging markets. So India, Pakistan, Nigeria, South Africa. And they also found that they were fielding a lot of inquiries from uh, individuals in developed countries too, that they were getting a lot of inquiries from people based in the US and also based in Canada, because again, people are looking for opportunities to diversify their investments uh, in times of economic downturn and also position themselves to be in a place where, again, they have the broadest access possible to global markets. Support for this podcast is provided by Avalara. Since 2004, Avalara's vision has been to harness the power of cloud technology to help simplify sales tax for businesses of all sizes. And their solutions are designed to affordably scale with businesses as they grow. Collecting tax for the government is something businesses just have to do, but getting the job done efficiently and correctly can be an incredible challenge because tax rules and regulations can be endlessly complicated. 
Avalara keeps track of how thousands upon thousands of products are taxed in more than 13,000 tax jurisdictions. And that's just in the United States. With more than 1,000 signed partner integrations, Avalara likely integrates with the ERP, e-commerce, mobile payment, and point-of-sale systems you use today. Find out how your business can be sales tax ready at avalara.com slash tax notes. That's avalara.com slash tax notes. Avalara, tax compliance done right. Is there any additional benefit to allowing in uh, these people that you referred to in one of your stories as digital nomads? <laughs> yes. So um, digital nomads are highly mobile workers. I mean, essentially, I think most office workers who are working remotely could find themselves becoming digital nomads if they decide to travel and work remotely from a sunny beach location. So in the case of digital nomads, you have a group of highly mobile workers who are traveling with money and governments want those workers to spend money in their countries. So they're not necessarily wealthy workers, but governments know that they have funds. So what you'll see across the board is that digital nomad visa programs will ask applicants for proof of employment or if they're unemployed, proof of savings or other income, and that they're imposing minimum income thresholds requirements to make sure that these people actually can contribute to the local economies once they do land. But that being said, um, I think we are beginning to see a bit of a backlash to the work from home trend. So if people do increasingly return to the office on a full-time basis, we'll see um, if these digital nomad programs have any sort of staying power. But for now, there definitely does seem to be a benefit and governments are pursuing them. Greece has a program. I believe the Bahamas has a program as well. Well, this is definitely going to be an interesting space to watch as it develops uh, over the next few years. Eldi, Ama, thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. Thanks so much, Dave. And now, coming attractions. Each week we highlight new and interesting commentary in our magazines. Joining me now is Acquisitions and Engagement Editor-in-Chief Paige Jones. Paige, what will you have for us? Thanks, Dave. In Tax Notes Federal, Marisa Peary provides background on the recent feud between the Republican governor of Florida and the Walt Disney Company. Brian Jen and Mike Tenenboim explore how the new foreign tax credit regulations affect the compulsory payment rules. In Tax Notes State, Timothy Noonan and Open Weaver Banks offer background on New York City's new pass-through entity tax. Tony Santiago looks at the major factors affecting the hiring and retention of tax professionals over the next year. In Tax Notes International, Peter Mason considers the dividing line between responsible tax mitigation and aggressive tax avoidance from a principal's perspective. Christina Allen analyzes Australia's new common law framework for characterizing worker-hirer relationships. In Featured Analysis, Robert Goulder examines the report by the Treasury Inspector General for Tax Administration on the FATCA regime. And finally, on the opinions page, Nana Amasarfo explains that the U.S. digital asset strategy needs a stronger tax focus. David Morse of the Coalition for a Prosperous America and Marty Sullivan of Tax Notes discuss what the U.S. tax response to the Russian invasion of Ukraine should be. That's it for this week. You can follow me online at Tax Stew, that's S T E W, and be sure to follow at Tax Notes for all things tax. If you have any comments, questions, or suggestions for a future episode, you can email us at podcast at taxanalyst.org. And as always, if you like what we're doing here, please leave a rating or review wherever you download this podcast. We'll be back next week with another episode of Tax Notes Talk. Tax Notes Talk is a production of Tax Notes. You can learn more about us by visiting www.taxnotes.com slash podcast. When major media wants the straight story, they turn to Tax Notes. Thank you for listening, and join us again for another edition of Tax Notes Talk. Want to see more like this? Subscribe for more tax videos. Special thanks to our executive producers, Jasper Smith and Paige Jones, as well as showrunner and audio engineer, Jordan Parrish.